today about the seven stages of the ethical diet. So, to start with, uh, we start with the definitions of what the food and the diet means. Food is any nutritious substance that people and animals seek or drink, plants absorb, in order to maintain their life and growth. And then the diet is the sum and the kinds of the food that again a person or other organisms habitually consume. Amigo, yeah. There? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, today we will talk about both the food and diet related to ethics. So, ethics means a way of living based on moral principles that governs a person's behavior uh, or way of conducting an activity. And ethics is a branch of philosophy. Usually some core ethical principles is uh, beneficence, so do good and enrich life, is non-maleficence, so do no harm. It involves autonomy, that each individual is in control, and also justice, fairness. So, before going to the seven steps, stages, I would like to mention cannibalism and anthropophagy. Uh, that's the act of consuming another individual of the same species as food. And it's a common practice that is practiced in the animal kingdom. More than 1,500 species have been documented practicing cannibalism. And of course, it was is well documented both in ancient and very recent times, and even in some parts of the world is still practiced. Uh, so that, as we see, is a diet and is food eating each other. Uh, but as we've realized, as humans have evolved in societies, uh, we avoid practicing cannibalism nowadays. Uh, based on ethics and moral values mostly, and our societies doesn't perceive it anymore as, uh, yeah, ethical. And of course, murdering someone and killing someone to consume him is illegal in most countries. Uh, so, societies evolved in not accepting cannibalism uh, due to ethics. So, beyond that, uh, now a percentage of humans on Earth start uh, thinking even more about ethics and in relation to their diet. Uh, and the principles of ethics of do not harm, and preserve life and reach life if possible. Uh, and based on those ethics as humans involved uh, and the consciousness, uh, we start exploring diets as the vegetarian diet, the vegan diet, the raw vegan diet, and the fruitarian diets. And us being on a, a raw and fruitarian festival, uh, yeah, it's a practice that we practice here these two weeks. So, after having talked about cannibalism, the next stages that involve ethics uh, with an order is, as we said, the vegetarian diet, the vegan. Then the next three stages, the raw till four, mostly raw, and the fully raw, it's kind of in one stage, but it's broken down in transitions to help people. And then going towards fruitarian diet, it's the frugivore food based raw vegan diet, and at last the fruitarian diet. So, why these stages are more ethical 
than uh, as it goes down the line. Uh, first, we start with a vegetarian diet. Uh, according to that, people who practice it uh, start omitting animal flesh and animal fat because mostly they have the principle of ethics of do not kill, so they want to avoid killing animals. Uh, that's why they decide their diet to omit anything that contains animal flesh and fat. And in that state, people include animal secretions like milk, dairy, eggs, and all the plant uh, matters that provide nutrition. And usually it's based on cooked, the vegetarian diet, most of the calories come from cooking other food. Next stage, some people realize that uh, it's more ethical for their consciousness to not only stop eating animals and murdering them for food, but also their secretions and what we call the animal products. Uh, because they also want to practice apart from the do not kill and the do not steal ethic value. So they want to avoid stealing and further exploitation of animals. So now they start omitting the milk, all the dairy products, the eggs and even honey. So in that stage humans uh, eating only plant foods and uh, yeah also again usually the vegan diet uh, is based mostly on the cooked plants the majority of the calories uh, and it can have also some transition transitions from a more processed vegan diet to a more whole foods diet and including more raw. Uh, then next, after that, some vegans start thinking more about ethics and they do not harm uh, principle. And then they start contemplating about start eating raw their foods instead of cooking them. And mostly the ethical aspect of that is because they are, want to practice non-harm to their own body, to their own uh, human and animal body. So they do it for health reasons. Uh, and uh, usually the first stage people go to start incorporating more raw is that they eat uh, raw plants during the day and then usually they have a cooked uh, meal, the last meal of the day or one of the three meals. And that's what we call like a raw till four or a raw till evening diet. People eat raw, start eating more raw, the roots, tubers, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, legumes, grains, nuts, seeds, fungi. And they start using more dehydrators, freezers, blenders, tweezers to help them imitate, that's wrong there, help imitate the cooked meals into a raw form and raw gourmet dishes. Uh, and in that stage, usually people avoid junk, processed foods, uh, packets, and they start becoming a little bit more conscious about the effect of sugar, and salt, and oil. So that's kind of the third stage, preparing them to uh, become fully raw. And then next one in transition is they start practicing usually most days, all their meals now are raw, and occasionally some days in the week or the month, uh, they can include some cooked vegan 
food. Uh, and again, people in that stage become even more custom of uh, trying yeah, raw gourmet dishes and imitating more raw meals. Uh, yeah, imitate their cooked meals. And then, when some of them uh, want, they kind of move to a fully 100% raw vegan diet. And in that stage, they no longer cooking uh, the plants. Uh, and yeah, in that stage, usually people avoid completely the uh, salt, the cooked uh, oils. Some of them they, cook, they include the raw cold pressed oil, which can be debatable whether it's truly raw or not, and some natural uh, salt. So they might uh, involve them. Uh, yeah. So when someone is eating uh, a 100% fully raw vegan diet usually includes all four groups that were included in the vegan diet, so they still consume all of the roots, tubers, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, grains, and legumes, nuts, seeds, and fungi that are edible in a raw form. Uh, with time, uh, some people realize that, uh, yeah, this diet can bring some issues and some problems uh, to them and also start contemplating more the ethical aspect and the not kill and the do not steal that extends from animals and uh, now it can involve plants that are living structures and beings that uh, they have their circle of life and they want to grow and procreate and uh, enjoy life. So in that state, some people, small minority, uh, start to meeting more plant matters and uh, realizing mimicking also the other primates. Uh, they start including more fruits in their raw vegan diet. So now on stage six, usually people start practicing the frugivore or the fruit-based raw vegan diet. Uh, in that diet is different than other primates because other primates, they are not vegan, they don't have that consciousness. They will eat insects, they will eat small animals, uh, they will eat eggs, birds. Uh, so, primates don't have a conscious of veganism. Uh, so, humans now, they try to mimic other primates, but also practice veganism and raw. So, in that stage, phoenix fruit based raw vegan diet. And usually in that stage people omit the roots, the tubers, the legumes, the grains, the seeds, the flowers, the, the fungi in raw form. And they tend to usually eat 70% or more of the calories, daily calories from fruits, with supplementing some tender stems, leaves, some vegetables and nuts and seeds. And usually at that stage, they use less the dehydrators, the blenders, the juicers, the processed raw gourmet foods. And the diet becomes more simple and whole food. Okay, and then the last ethical stage is now in that state, the person completely acknowledges the uh, ethics of do not harm and do not kill plants. 
because in that states only fruits are consumed. And by consuming fruits, someone does not eat no other plant parts, no roots, no tubers, no grains, no seeds, no greens, no flowers, no fungi. We just eat whole fruits, and that means the edible flesh that surrounds the seeds. Okay? And that is a diet that now considers ethics in all life forms, in humans, in animals, and in plants. And only people consume fruits that are given by the trees and the plants, the flesh of that fruit, to facilitate their procreation and disperse the seed. And uh, this flesh of fruits is the only biological structure that is provided by living organism for food for other uh, animals. So plants create the flesh around their seeds to appeal to animals. It has a taste, it has an aroma, it has color, uh, nutrients, water to feed animals and then those animals in turn spread their seeds, their embryos uh, to facilitate the procreation of the plants. In that state, uh, now we can see the, again the ethics Stage one, people avoid eating animals, killing them. And the second stage, they avoid stealing and exploiting animals, so they omit the secretions. And then, when people start practicing more the raw and the food, the frugivore and the fruitarian diet, they realize that eating, for example, the root vegetables, when someone eats the root, the plant get, he gets killed. So when someone goes harvest a root, automatically the plant dies. Uh, so you someone terminates life of that living being. Then the tubers, uh, which are not exactly the roots, and they can still be harvested without killing the plant uh, automatically at that time. The problem, the unethics about that, is that the tubers serve the role as food for the new plants to suit. So, when that plant dies, uh, those potatoes underground, they will shoot new plants, and this is the food for them. So, when we go and we take those tubers, we prevent the procreation of the cycle of the plants. Uh, and, yeah. Those plant offsprings cannot longer procreate. So we terminate that life. Then, what's the ethical aspect of seeds, and which are grains, legumes, nuts? What are the seeds? The seeds are the embryos of the plant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like when animals have their embryos, they're living, they're dormant, they're ready to sprout. Each plant creates their seeds to be dispersed, be dispersed, not to be eaten. Then, when someone consumes the leaves and flowers, 
and the stems. In that state, uh, we, not, we don't necessarily kill the plant, but we harm it. Okay? Because the stems serve as biological role to transport nutrients, and, like it's the spine of the plant, the column, stability. So when we eat those, yeah, the plants, their life becomes short, and yeah, we're damaging them. Uh, eating flowers, we prohibit their procreation, and eating the seeds again, as we said, is the uh, abuse. What about the leaves, the green leaves? Green leaves are the solar panel of the plants. They are meant to create energy for the plant, so when we go and pick them, we, the life of the plant can be affected, its energy supply, so it's an act of harm to that living organism. And then the fruits, as we said, is the most ethical diet because the flesh of all these fruits is intentionally provided by the plants to feed animals. They are given freely to us. Now, plants, we said that leaves, uh, seeds, roots, and uh, tubers, it's not ethical because we damage the plant. And because the plants do not have these structures, to provide us food to animals. They have defense mechanisms. And that's what, what we call the nutrition and the nutrients and the different toxins of the plants. So plants as living organisms, they have defend themselves from animals. So in, in their plant structures, they include all these chemicals like lectins that are indigestible proteins that when accumulate can cause harm to the gut wall of the animal and decrease absorption, oxalates, phytates. Uh, and then we see all these plant structures have the highest added nutrients and fruits are ripe fruits, very ripe fruits. The edible flesh is the only structure that has the less of these defense chemicals or none at all. The most ripe the fruit it is the less of these defense chemicals it has. Now, that's the problem when someone follows, uh, one of the problems when someone follows a long-term raw vegan diet. They start consuming a lot of these uh, poisons in their body. So, and that's cooking, it helps destroy a lot of these defense mechanisms. So, cooking has that advantage that in raw diet, long term, this can start coming in. Another problem in plants and their seeds especially is the phytoestrogen content, content they contain, which are hormones of the plants and they must, as I said, exist on seeds because seeds want to grow, the embryo wants to grow, so it has a lot of phytoestrogens that promote rapid growth. And then there is research that links high phytoestrogens in people's diet with infertility, breast cancer, decreased thyroid function, and possible other associated health risks. 
because these histoestrogens can bind on receptors of, of humans and other animals and can disrupt long term their endocrine function. That's another problem of raw uh, plants, especially seeds. And we see the foods that are higher in phytoestrogens are mostly seeds. Yeah. Okay, now, how about cooking? Why cooking is, uh, people, some people consider it uh, harming for their body and uh, not ethical towards their own body. It's because when we cook a plant or an animal flesh, certain chemicals are formed in, that, uh, in those degrees of 100% Celsius or more. One of these chemicals is the HCAs and the PAH. And the higher the plant or the animal is cooked, the higher the temperature, the more of these carcinogenic chemicals are formed that affect human cells on the DNA level, causing mutations. Uh, another chemical that is formed, especially when proteins and starches bind together through heat, uh, is called the advanced glycation end products. And we can see like frying and grilling and roasting that are the most high heat uh, applied. It produces 4,000 to 9,000 of these chemicals and less temperature like boiling and steaming produces a lot less. And uh, yeah, accumulation of these chemicals can contribute to inflammation, osteosclerosis, kidney damage and various other problems. Another chemical that is formed is the acrylamide, especially on starches and bread. And it happens from 100 degrees Celsius and more. Another problem with cooking uh, the plants is what some scientists uh, described as digestive leukocytosis is means that uh, it has been documented that when people eat cooked plants uh, immune reactions can start increasing and the number of white cells was observed increasing so means the immune system is responding uh, it can consider it as something harmful uh, and probably is because of uh, uh, the denature of the proteins when they are cooked and the denature of the starches or it could be because of uh, when something is cooked it has different microbiome than when it's raw Uh, also, another problem with cooking is that uh, destroys en enzymes and vitamins. Uh, some plant nutrients can become more available with cooking, bioavailable, but others uh, get destroyed, especially vitamin C and B vitamins. Another problem with cooked is that it has a different microbiome than raw foods. And that we can see it very simple. Raw foods have a long shelf life. Uh, you harvest something from the garden, you put it on a countertop, 
it can last days and very slowly start degenerating. When you go and you cook that plant with certain hours, it rots unless you put it on a freezer or a refrigerator. It's rotting because different strains of bacteria multiply very rapidly. And the Food and the Drug Administration recommends that when someone cooks something, uh, not to eat it after two hours of cooking it. Because these uh, bacteria start multiplying very, very rapidly. And we can see like how it, they can grow in numbers and the more time something cooked it stays unconsumed. So when people eat cooked plants and vegetables, in their microbiome, colonies of different bacteria and different mutations of bacteria start uh, existing. And that's one of the reasons that uh, is believed that people find very difficult to transition from a cooked diet to a raw diet and they experience a lot of cravings is because they have been inoculated with this type of colonies in the gut and when those colonies don't receive uh, cooked plant matter uh, hungers and cravings can develop. Also, a lot of people experience addiction on cooked foods and again, these strains of microbiomes believe that can be a factor for the addictive element of the cooked plants and flesh. Yeah. So that's the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, Yes. I have many questions. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, one question about the tubers. Yes. Like, for example, if I cut a yuca to harvest the yuca under, I can chop it up into pieces and then replant all those stalks, and a new yuca will grow. So, yes. in, by doing that, wouldn't I be helping it to proliferate? Yes, you could uh, help it in some ways, uh, but also at the same time you can harm the existing plant also. Because the cubers, I said, they provide nutrients for the new plants, but also provide nutrients to the old plant. So both the old plant and the new plants receive nutrients. So, yeah, someone can use it to uh, like, uh, help it procreate in some ways, but also harming the existing life of the plant. How can you quantify the harm when you can't really understand where plant feels in the same way? Yes, uh, for my understanding is that the fact that the tuber has a lot of these, what well, we call them, the nutrients and chemicals, is that the plant doesn't want the, its tuber to be eaten by animals. So, according to that, those defense chemicals, to me, it indicates that the living organism doesn't want it to be disturbed. Kind 
have, when I think of plants, I think of them, okay, yes, they're alive, they're structures, but wants, desires, feelings, this is very like anthro anthropomorphic, I feel. With yes. plants, it, maybe that's how, how it is because that's what they needed to survive, because an animal eating the tuber is not gonna chop it up and propagate it, but a human can do that, so it can actually help proliferate and help like create more of those plants. So. Yes, but the problem is it, it contains it these chemicals yeah. and defenses. So it has it, each plant and its living organism has its own ways of procreating, and, yeah, and it doesn't want to be disturbed. That's why it has defense poisons. And wait, so like through cooking, those could be. Different. Yeah, cooking is a way that humans, uh, in order to survive, uh, they use fire to be able to eat all the animals and the plants as food. So it's a survival diet in expense. It doesn't mean it's the most ethical diet. So, yeah. So cooking on one way it helps people eat a lot of what we they call food. But on the other hand, because of the chemicals that are created in the microbiome in the cooked, it their body can be harmed at the same time. From a lot of the recent research that I've seen on uh, nutrition, specifically doing with the dealing with the human microbiome, what I've seen over and over again is that the more diversity mm -hmm. a microbiome has, the healthier the the human will be. So this has to do with longevity. When they study different people, this is what they've seen that your health is kind of related to the diversity within your micro microbiome. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering on the fruitarian, like if you're gonna reduce things to only fleshy fruit, aren't you greatly reducing the diversity within the gut? Uh, from my understanding, uh, there's still diversity maintained because fruits have fiber and it's different fruits, uh, different seasons or months of the year. So some diversity is maintained. Well, it's still a big reduction compared to being able to eat, for example, all fruits, vegetables, meats, Yes, uh, it, it could be a reduction on the like, species and the variety, but uh, certain people who practice the fruitarian diet uh, due to ethics mm -hmm. don't, don't consider that as a problem. Okay. And us usually people who practice that, they live in a very natural environment because we think that our microbiome is only enriched by the diet, but it only can be documented if it's also enriched when we come in contact with the soil and the plants and through our skin, uh, through water, so through the environment. So eating plants is the, not the only way to enrich our microbiome. Mm -hmm. Living in nature, in my understanding, is the most uh, key uh, element for someone to enrich and strengthen the microbiome. The more sterile uh, environment they live in, like in cities, more difficult to enrich the microbiome, unless it's through different type of foods. I do have a few other questions, but I don't know if anybody else has questions. No, I feel like I don't. <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, Denise has a question, or, yeah, Jen, you have a question. Can I add just like, what I think about that? Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I believe that a raw diet would have like the most microbiome diversity because mm -hmm. you have to eat more food, like in volume, so you're eating like just more, possibly different bacteria. Plus, you're getting it right from the ground, you're not cooking it, so there's quite a lot of bacteria there. And there's a lot of variety of like herbs. And if you're getting all your calories from like more greens and lots of different fruits, that's introducing like so many different nutrients to your gut. And I think that when you cook food and maybe start getting a lot of the calories from of, of your daily nutrient needs from cooked foods, you might take away from how much fruits or vegetables you may be consuming um, with like smaller amounts. So I think it might end up like lowering your microbiome diversity in some way, which is kind of similar to what everyone was saying. I think one of the best
best ways would be obviously in a garden or to be like in the water outside, really like nurtured in nature. Thank you. Yes. I heard that uh, humans, uh, um, as just like other primates, we have a digestive system that's exactly like that of, a, of, of another primate, like a chimpanzee. And they don't just eat fruit, they eat leafy greens too. I know you mentioned they'll, they'll eat other animals too, but ideally, I think if, if they're in an environment where they have plenty of fruit and greens, that's what they'll eat. So they, doesn't that indicate that we should be eating leafy greens too? Uh, in my understanding of other primates and my research is that they don't have exactly the same digestive system as humans. For example, uh, they have a larger, large intestine because, and that helps them absorb more from green leaves and barks and stems. Humans have a shorter large intestine than other primates. That's one anatomical difference from my understanding. And of course, the taste buds are different. And, uh, so it's not exactly the same. Uh, second is that, uh, as we said, primates eat other, uh, as we said, animal flesh and secretion and eggs. Uh, even if it's fruit, fruit, fruits, they still can eat uh, animal flesh secretions and barks and leaves. So to me, uh, it's not an indication of ethical diet. Primates don't consider ethics in my understanding of the diet, is they eat what is available and what they can find. So it's more like opportunistic animals. In my understanding, only humans have the ability to act out of ethics. That's why only humans practice vegans. Primates don't practice vegans. Okay? And raw, yeah, they use raw because they don't have the ability to use the cooking. It's not a conscious decision as such. It doesn't come out of any ethics. Yes, please. There you go. I have a multi-part question about fruits themselves. You were mentioning that the fruits to be consumed in a fruitarian diet include ripe fruits that have flesh surrounding a seed. Uh, pineapples don't meet this criteria. They also have defensive chemicals. I don't know what they're called exactly. Uh, how do you view pineapples in a fruitarian diet? Okay, the first question is uh, why they, they don't meet that uh, criteria? Because from my understanding, they also have seeds, pineapples. They, they can, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a fused flower. Yes. It's both flower and fruit. Okay. okay. So it has the seed that it can procreate through consuming the flesh. It goes through the body and the human or the primate will poop it out and disperse it like tomatoes or figs or other small seeded fruits. So having that flesh uh, is to facilitate that. The defense mechanisms, you're exactly right, all fruits have defense mechanisms. The flesh, if the seed is not ripe and viable for procreation, the plant has strong poisons in the flesh of the fruits. So unripe fruits, they are not edible, they are very poisonous. Because the plant doesn't want someone to start consuming the fruit when the seed is not mature enough, the embryo is not mature enough. Mm. When the, the embryo becomes mature enough that it can sprout, then it's time for the flesh to start ripening mm. and the 
defense chemicals and the toxic chemicals start missing, and the more ripe the flesh, or, or uh, minimal or none defense chemicals there. The second part of my question would be about spicy peppers. Mm -hmm. Would the defense chemicals seem to increase as they ripen? Uh, yes. Uh, we, like with fruits, my understanding is not all fruits are evolved to be consumed by primates or humans or all type of animals. So, like a pepper, a spicy pepper, you said, it might be more directed to certain insects or certain birds that they have no problem with the spice, spiciness. So not all fruits have developed for human consumption. Most of the fruits uh, are mostly adapted for birds. Okay. Uh, there, and that's why a lot of them have like low calories. And yeah. So yeah, I think. So a fruit area that is fruit peppers. Yes, having certain chemicals that will upset an animal's digestive system. Uh, yeah. In that case, yeah, you don't eat that fruit. Yeah, so not all fruits uh, are meant for humans. And that's one of the problems sometimes fruitarians or raw uh, people, through divorce or fruitarians experience, they base their diet in fruits that may be not optimal for human consumption, for their energy and for the nutrients and certain other uh, yeah, functions that uh, they struggle. I have a question, just, yes. just out of curiosity. As Sarah touched upon it, like you said that uh, the plants doesn't want, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just curious what you, what you believe that, if you believe that plants have an awareness and desire or, yeah, I'm just a little bit curious there, what, what your perspective is. I mean, start talking about the sentient like whether plants are sentient and have consciousness and feelings. I think this type of research is not as uh, on early stages or and there's mostly hypotheses. And uh, uh, personally, I'm not uh, uh, like occupied uh, or base my ethics on whether plants have feelings or thoughts or consciousness. For, for me personally, the ethic is as a plant, as a living organism that has defense mechanism that doesn't want to be killed or harmed and wants to procreate and does its circle of life and is a living being. To me, that's enough to, if I have other food, to let it be and not consume it. Uh, so, yeah. Other people and other scientists are looking more into, yeah, whether plants have feelings or consciousness. Yeah. Yes, Mike. Uh, well, I like that you said that this, that most mm -hmm. people eat a survival diet, mm -hmm. and that if it's lower on the ethical list, it's more survival every time you go down. Yes. And I understand that over time, we as humans required survival diets for many times. Do you think that any of those survival diets are even required at this point? And do you think that the top level right now that you indicate here in your talk is the best for human health? Okay. Uh, this presentation is mostly based on ethics. Uh, and uh, also we mentioned... Uh, 
because of living organisms having defense mechanisms, how uh, health can be impacted through the various chemicals and the different microbiome. Uh, but health is mental, emotional, physical, and it involves a lot of factors, not just nutrition. It involves the environment also, uh, and the whole lifestyle of the person. So when we talk about health, uh, we need to consider a lot more factors. Uh, and ideally, in my understanding and opinion, a most ethical diet under certain factors and parameters can link to, more, to a more optimal health for humans. But that doesn't mean someone following the most ethical diet necessarily will achieve health in their life because health, as I said, it involves a lot more factors than diet. So someone going to Delhi tomorrow doesn't mean they will remain healthy. So, it, yeah, it involves a lot of factors, the health aspect, my understanding. And it's important for me the transition, the, the stages uh, to be done long term, not rushed. So the body and the microbiome and all the functions of the body and the metabolism and the absorption and the cells and also the mind, and the emotions, transition in a longer period of time and adapt uh, to be able to uh, maintain, have more chances to maintain health. Sometimes when people in my understanding, uh, do very quickly the stages or jump the stages, it, it most likely can backfire long term, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Yes, Kim. Uh, if my understanding is correct, you've been fruitarian since 2014? Yes. yes. Yeah, so 10 years? 9 years. 9 years, okay. So I'm just uh, curious, like, what's, what's the benefits that you've been uh, experiencing? Uh, clarity of mind. Uh, very easy digestion. more balance of emotions and uh, better sleep uh, not having like intense hunger or cravings uh, or any what I consider like an addictive element to the food more simplicity in my life like preparing food I Eat less amounts over the years. Uh, yeah, and I I feel my body uh, runs more efficiently. And also uh, the raw and especially the fruitarian diet, it was the one that connected that me more with nature. So I experienced different connection with the plants and all the natural energies and appreciate, appreciating them. And yeah, and through a fruitarian diet, uh, because uh, I, I think that the body starts utilizing also the energies of the environment, like uh, the sun, the water, the air, the uh, uh, yeah, the soil, like 
they, all these energies of the nature act as, in some way, supplementing mm. the diet uh, uh, of eating fruits or all. So it gave me a whole different appreciation of nature and plants and yeah, being here and more connection to them. Do you experience like getting more insights about like life itself? Uh, as I said, improved my clarity of mind and uh, my emotions stabilized. And uh, yeah, I believe over time a lot of my perceptions change and perspectives, and possibly I'm more in touch with my intuition. Were those benefits immediate, or did it take an extended period of time to realize all of that? From my experience, uh, we needed years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask about the phytoestrogens. Yes. Um, I had heard a lot about these, but. A lot of people were worried, for example, switching to a vegan diet, so this is like while you're still eating and switching to a vegan diet, people would be worried, oh, you know, I shouldn't have soy because it's high in phytoestrogens and this can be, you know, damaging, it increases estrogen levels. But the research has actually shown that phytoestrogen, because it's a plant estrogen, although it does bind to our estrogen receptors, it blocks the receptor from having true mammalian estrogen bind to it. So it's actually been shown to be protective against cancer, for example. Yes. Uh, there are researches that on the benefits of phytoestrogens, and especially also menopause symptoms. And uh, yeah, like in many substances, there are research that can indicate benefits, and other research that can indicate disruption or harm. And we similar with phytoestrogens, yeah. Specifically, do you know what is the harm? Because of that theory that it increases your estrogen was not valid because it actually doesn't increase estrogen. Actually yeah, it. but so because it binds on the same receptors, yeah. receptors yeah. Uh, there is some disruption on the endocrine function. Have thyroid especially. Okay. From, yeah, so there are different research about that. So people can. Another, one, one more question I had yeah. was about the, about sprouting yeah. because legumes and whole grains, uh, all these anti nutrients that they have, by sprouting them, mm -hmm. I've heard that you can eliminate the all those negative elements, and it actually becomes much more healthy and easier to digest, and you get a higher nutrient content, and it's still a raw food, but you are still eating the seed, but it's yeah. actually supposed to be very healthy. Uh, yes. Sprouting certain enzyme inhibitors degrees because now the sprouting starts, the new plant starts, several inhibitors that were in the embryo of the dormant state diminish. But then certain other chemicals can start form, like some sprouts become more bitter. Uh, if people notice it in sprouts. Uh, so other toxic uh, chemicals have formed. Yeah. Sweet. Yes, some can become sweeter, some can become bitter. The problem also with sprouting is, yeah. again, different microbiome, uh, bacteria can start forming in sprouts. So, so you have to kind of do it properly and keep washing it. Yeah. If you do it properly, it should, it should be beneficial, no? Yes, I mean, like in, in things, you get some, can get some benefit, but also at the same time, can be some problems there. And uh, eating sprouts to me is even more unethical than uh, eating the dormant the babies. seed. It's the babies. <laughs> yes, because it's the ember, but not only that, you already walked it out. It has life, it's shooting out. And, yeah. But again, that's, you said yourself, when speaking of ethical diet, we don't know. Yeah. There's 
not any research that could say that plants are sentient, that they have feelings and desires yeah. more than just biological mechanisms that are fighting to survive yes. like any other living thing. True. So, yeah, based on that. Yeah. Not about feelings or yeah. sentiment. Wait, one more little thing. Yes. So you did mention how, um, specifically with ethics, mm -hmm. it's most ethical to eat this way, going down the stages. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, from my perspective, it would be uh, kind of uh, difficult because I'm not at the second to last stage. You know, I'm I eat a vegan diet. I try to eat mostly raw, but I'm mm -hmm. not thinking ethically in terms of cooked food is unethical. So I probably have a different mindset on it than if I was like closer to the last stage. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering in terms of our own health, if I know that like, uh, you know, greens for example, have so much more nutrients, they're so much more nutrient dense. Uh, if I eat leafy greens, a lot of leafy greens, I'm getting so many more nutrients and like the very health promoting nutrients and doing better for my own body and you're saying like, you know, our, we are animals, so we should, that's like another stage is to want the best for your body. Where, how do you categorize that over the plant leaf, for example? So it's like, I'm breaking this leaf off, I'm gonna eat it, I'm taking the solar panel away from the plant, mm -hmm. but I'm adding so much nutrition and vitality to my life. Yes, and also adding some poisonous chemicals that exist in the leaves of the plants. So would you say that all plants? All plants have poisons, yes, have other the nutrients or toxic elements. What about weighing out the balance? Aren't the nutrients okay. so much higher than the... Okay, <laughs> and that comes back to its personal lifestyle, its personal environment, ethical ethics in themselves, uh, health, uh, we said health has multiple factors, so each person weighs where they are in life and the different factors and they decide in what extent the ethics and the health and the way they live and how to balance all that. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. I think we've uh, passed the time five minutes over. Uh, Yes, we can finish here. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.